Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about the eclipse, which Mm. makes perfect sense. Lisa has gone down to Texas to watch the eclipse, and our video engineer, Jano, has also (laughs) gone down to watch the eclipse. So it seems that the power of the eclipse is thrumming through our little community. And of course, it's captured the imagination of so many millions of people, and we thought we would um, just walk around that and talk about it for a little bit. Yeah. That's what, to me, is so compelling, is that this event has captured the attention, the imagination, um, energy of so, so many people that they want to go. They want to be in the path. They want to witness it. And um, and we're not witnessing it, Joseph, you and I. <laughs> so, what does that say about us, perhaps? <laughs> to, the, the, there's another problem, maybe. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> the, <laughs> that we're um, somehow missing this opportunity to access the numinous. Although um, I am curious about how numinous this is uh and what what a compelling event it is to have the world blacked out for a total of eight minutes i think i think that the total eclipse is something rather rather brief but of course all the excitement leading up to it and, and the collective tension about what this means yeah and it is a celestial event that overtakes everything in its path. Uh, the plants, the animals, uh, birds return to their roosts, bees return to their hives. And um, this man named uh, Daniel Beverly, who was, a, I think, a post-doc student in 2017, he measured uh, plant leaves, sagebrush leaves, and he could he could tell that they showed signs of stress uh, when the eclipse occurred. That that everything living knows that this is out of pattern, and that it is threatening. That darkness is not expected at this time, and it's not okay. Uh, so I'm you know this celestial event has. It unifies us, doesn't it? That we take the sun for granted, and it shows up every day. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't. And we are all caught in that experience. The world turned upside down, plunged into darkness during the daytime. And if we imagine living in an ancient world, Mm. Uh, where it may happen very, very, very infrequently where we live. I mean, right now people can fly and drive hours and hours. They know when it's going to happen. But 500 years ago, you may have never seen an eclipse, or if it happened, it Mm -hmm. would have happened maybe once in a lifetime, in as much as it would happen as a total eclipse right where you live, where it can be visible. and with. I guess, lack of astronomic information, it would come upon you suddenly, unexpectedly. I mean, there you were working in a field, Mm -hmm. middle of the day, and all of a sudden, the birds are acting strange, the animals are strange, the light is changing in the sky, the the shadows apparently do Mm -hmm. very, very strange things. And your vision experiences all kinds of distortions. 
And then all of a sudden, for those eight minutes, this shocking, perhaps even terrifying, event has occurred uh-huh. without explanation. Right. And I, I can imagine that it would be terrifying. Uh, one of the little historical facts I uh, uncovered was that the, the, in ancient Greece, uh, somewhere around 600 BC, the Lydians and the Medes had been at war for some number of years, and there was a solar eclipse. And they were all so uh, stricken by this, of the awesome power of it and being plunged into darkness, that the meaning that they made of it was that they just had to make peace, uh, that, that the gods had appeared and interfered, and if a celestial event of this magnitude could take place, that, that uh, human concerns about human enemies and um, being at war uh, somehow had to come uh, to an end. Uh, in, in you pardon the pun here, of in the light of such darkness <laughs> of that, that petty human concerns and warfare had to stop. And that goes to that really um, deep feeling that we have, that there is a relationship between the microcosm and, mm-hmm. the, microcosm and the macrocosm. That Exactly. Uh, what's happening in the heavens echoes in what's happening in human beings, but here, yes. what's happening in human beings is echoing somewhere yeah. in the realm of the gods, and consequently, this massive yeah. sense of responsibility yeah. that then emerges. Yeah, I, I really like that, Joseph, and it touches on the alchemical uh, mantra of as above, so below, as below, so above, that there's resonance between um, let's say, individual human beings or plants and earth that us as individuals and the stars, uh, the movements of the planets. Uh, but, we, uh, we affect each other, that there are parallel processes. So when the solar eclipse comes, what does it mean you know, for you as an individual or for me? Uh, because we're connected to the cosmos. I think that's the instinctive draw to astrology. Mm. That even Mm. people that don't think of themselves as particularly new age, quote unquote, they're sitting down reading the morning paper and you just can't (laughs) quite resist going to the astrology (laughs) section and and hoping even that something Mm -hmm. that's happening in the heavens has some resonance to my personal um, behavior yeah. that day, yeah. the magic that's going to happen to me as I'm going about the business of my life. Yeah. Well, we get, and Jung certainly got with his theory of synchronicity, you know, we get that we're part of a bigger field. We get that there are connections. Sometimes we can't totally explain them. Um, but I think an event like this solar eclipse, uh, brings us close to something astonishing in its magnitude of that the sun in the course of its journey across the sky, uh, the Greeks had Phaeton pulling uh, pulling a chariot uh, with the sun hitched to it across the sky, Um, that something amazing is, is happening that has awe in it. Even though we now know all the science, right? Mm -hmm. Of Oh, this is because of this and this and the trajectories are and we can plot it down actually to the second uh, that it it still catches us up in something in something greater. And I'm so curious about uh, what people have written about uh, witnessing an eclipse of how eerie it is mm-hmm. that people look like um, those old photographs of uh, sepia tinted photographs. Uh, things look tinny is the word that's used. Uh, so our our perception of everything is distorted. And what is the connection between 
transcendence, reverence, wonder, awe, dread, and terror, and the uncanny. They're all wrapped up in this experience uh, that people are traveling in order to experience themselves. And that speaks to something about the modern psyche, hmm. that we're so exposed to images and experiences in a way. I mean, we can type into YouTube uh, videos of previous eclipses, and hmm. we can watch them and then trick ourselves into thinking, oh, well, now we know what that's like, because we have some kind of imagistic hmm. representation. We can know so much about everything, maybe anything that's going on on the planet, which gives us a sense that the ordinary has infested all things. And the mm. danger of that is that it tricks the ego into thinking that it is the master of all things because it can dispassionately catch a glimpse of all things. And yet something inside of the soul wants the ego to experience awe, mm. wants it to be yeah. in right relationship to things that are larger than it. And this goes to, I think, what you were pointing to a moment ago, that the enormous amount of energy that people have to, right now, to travel down to Texas so that they can be right there, right in the right spot to have this experience there's many dimensions, but this feeling of awe, which I think is this uh, respect and fear and wonder, mm -hmm. all, all in a moment. Mm -hmm. And how rare that is. I, I'm, as we're talking about it, I'm thinking about the, the first moment that I ever experienced awe, which came upon me very surprisingly. I was in my, um, early 30s. And it was not something that I thought too much about, but I was really delving into Jung's work and reading and just really beginning to think deeply about it. I had occasion to go to the West Coast with a friend of mine, and we were driving, driving down the coast, and we just stopped really early on in the process and came to the edge of a, a West Coast beach, the Pacific Ocean. And the unbelievable violence of the ocean, which I had never seen having been raised on the Atlantic, the power, the crashing of the waves, the deafening sound, seeing the seals, the heads of the seals bobbing in and out of the waves, that um, it just knocked the breath out of me for a minute or so. and. Um, and I had this feeling that the ocean could kill me, <laughs> which had never occurred to me yeah. as a child being raised on the water. And this combination of respect and fear and wonder for the power yeah. of this moment, this natural force, um, it just made me gasp. So there is something here about accessing the infinite through the power of nature, which is as old as man, of uh, man ascending mountains uh, to get closer to something transcendent, the power of the Pacific Ocean uh, that is so wild. Uh, and and crashing, I I I understand. I was raised on the Atlantic too, and I was, holy cow, this isn't what I was expecting. When the first time I saw the Pacific Ocean, uh, which is far from Pacific, <laughs> so there is there is something here about the power of nature uh, to reflect and evidence and give us an experience of the infinite. And, and Jung says, um, and I'm quoting from his memoir, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, 
the decisive question for man is, is he related to something infinite or not? That is the telling question of his life. Only if we can know that the thing which truly matters is the infinite can we avoid fixing our interest upon futilities and upon all kinds of goals which are not of real importance. Mm. Uh, he, he writes this in a chapter, uh, Late Thoughts and Life After Death, that, you know, after his uh, very, very long life and in his late years, that this is what he writes as the key question for man. And we have intimations of it when we see the ocean or an eclipse. That uh, something can catch us up in it. That there is other that we live within it. I mean, if you're in the path of the eclipse, uh, you will be witness to it. You will be uh, inside it, so to speak. Uh, something greater will have your full being in its grasp. At least that is the hope. Yes. That, that there's something, there's an instinct inside of us who want and to hope that that will happen, even in this age of enormous rationality um, since the Age of Enlightenment. Yeah. And we've benefited greatly, of course, by moving away from superstition, let's say in medicine, you know, to be able to stop bloodletting, you know, as a primary <laughs> <laughs> tool of, you know, treatment and expanding science into all of these areas. And yet we've lost something that the world used to be enchanted mm. and our rationality has disenchanted our lives. Uh. In some ways, that's helped us, of course. And yet, what is it that people are hoping for to be right there in the path of this total eclipse? Mm. And what, what I think we were saying is the possibility of the re-enchantment of at least those eight minutes that the universe can be spectacular, amazing, um, be full of feeling rather than just full of thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, I think um, you've really hit on something very important. I like your word enchantment of the feelings of awe and wonder and dread and all that. And it takes me to the dance, you know, what is the dance between uh, science and enchantment, wonder, mm -hmm. awe, feeling, being part of something greater? Because if we reduce everything to a series of calculations of, you know, here's the path, um, and here's the time that the eclipse will be there in your area, um, uh, to a hilltop near you. Uh, <laughs> It's utter. It's simply science. It's simply fact. Of uh, versus the feeling of enchantment. Of I, I am part of something greater. I am part of a mystery. Uh, and we want to feel awe, wonder, mystery. We want that feeling. And I think science and all our technology and machines, we live so far from nature, most of us. And that is our original source of enchantment. There was a time when the trees spoke and we had totem animals and the world was, the world around us was alive. And we have memories of this, you know, as, as children, the fact that children play with dolls. And when we're mm. very, very young, we have a, a feeling of certainty that your doll needs to be fed <laughs> or it needs to be tucked in next to you, that, that your doll is, has yeah. feelings in some fashion. I mean, that's that primary 
instinct inside of us to ensoul the world around us and mm-hmm. to make it in some way responsive to humanity. And I think with the idea of the doll, that these seemingly inanimate objects also need things from us. And so one of the things that Jung writes about is that when he was in his investigations and meeting with various shaman, he had a conversation with one who said that part of the responsibility of the tribe was to help the sun rise Mm -hmm. each morning and that something catastrophic would likely happen. Very much the way a child thinks, my doll needs to be fed and kept warm and needs to be tended. Mm -hmm. And that's another side of that miraculous magic that people feel that not only are we reliant on the sun, the sun may be reliant Mm -hmm. on us. And there are some accounts in ancient manuscripts that during an eclipse, uh, people might fire arrows into the eclipse because some demonic force was Mm -hmm. attacking the sun and everyone in the tribe needed to, to help defend the integrity and the life of the sun. Yes, there's, there are accounts of that. And of course, there are so many myths uh, around the world of uh, the sun being eaten mm-hmm. during an eclipse of by a, a dragon or a frog or a jaguar. Or uh, the, I think there's quite a list of something, the sun being devoured, mm. uh, an image of, of the light, of, of consciousness, life itself and uh, that that we are in relationship to it you know that if you you'll you'll go out and try to defend against it you'll shoot arrows to kill the demon that has swallowed the sun of that is living in an ensouled world and I, I don't think it's possible to have an ensouled relationship with an iPad uh, or, or a phone or social media. I, somehow I think those things um, lack the inherent capacity of imagination and wonder uh, uh, versus something like this eclipse, which calls so many people to an experience of of wonder and awe and feeling part of. We need a relationship. That's what it boils down to. We need a relationship with with the world and with our own souls feeling part of, feeling touched, feeling connected. And I think as you're talking about needing the relationship, is that we need a true encounter, not mm-hmm. the fantasy of an encounter. Oh, that's exactly. So, I mean, people have these internet affairs with people that they've never met through emails or texting, which is the fantasy of a relationship or the fantasy of an encounter, yeah. even the fantasy of the eclipse. Yes. So I understand that people, they want to drive to that first date with the moon. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They're just texting. Texting the moon is not going to really cut it. You've got to yeah. drive down to Texas. And you've got to meet the experience head on. And then, as you were saying, through the lived experience, that's where the relationship is, is possible, as it is between two people. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about this idea of um, eating. A couple of little fun facts. Uh, the Chinese uh, ideogram. For the eclipse is the same ideogram for the word eat. Uh-huh. So I, I think there's something very, uh-huh. very alive in that image of the moon impinging on the sunlight um, and to fantasize that something dark and mysterious is taking bites out of the sun until it's just a crescent and then finally is simply a, a black circle ringed with fire. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, another sort of fact that I uncovered is that because of uh, the size of our moon and the sun and its distance from the earth, uh, we have the opportunity to see a total eclipse. That that um, the sun can be completely blocked out by the moon, which is four hundred times bigger. That is, you know, some four hundred uh, light years away from the sun. But the math works out perfectly that it wouldn't be a total eclipse unless the distances and sizes of sun, moon, and earth uh, made it possible. So who knows? We may be somewhat unique, um, at least in this universe, and even being able to have uh, a total eclipse. Uh, so I'm curious as to the psychological parallels um, in what gets eclipsed in us. How, when do we experience an eclipse with uh, the sun as the solar principle of light and consciousness? And it's long been a symbol of light and consciousness. And then comes the night when things are dark and things slither around in the dark. And uh, that's long been a symbol for the unconscious. So in alchemy, there is a a not well-known image called the the soul Niger, or the black sun. Mm. And it shows up occasionally. I believe in the Splendor Solus, which is one of the alchem- alchemical texts, that um, on a somewhat barren landscape, there is this um, very somber image of a sun with rays coming out from the back of it. And clearly, I think, in in a naturalistic interpretation, it is the eclipsed sun. Mm. And, and even apparently as we look at the sun when the eclipse is in its fullness, and apparently one can safely look right into the phenomena when the moon is totally covering the sun, and there seems to be these strands, these strange um, strands of light, that are emitted mm-hmm. around the shadow of the moon. But of course, it looks like the black sun is emitting mm-hmm. a secret light. And the alchemists called that the, the lux occulta, the hidden light. In one sense, that's true, even astronomically, when the moon totally eclipses the sun, that there are phenomena of light that we normally wouldn't see, including suddenly the stars become visible, Mm. planets that are nearby suddenly become visible in the middle of the day, and light seems to rise up from the horizon Mm. as the reflected light from a distance continues to bounce off of the earth and a number of other things. But the idea that in the midst of darkness, there is a secret light that is Mm -hmm. only visible when the sun is eclipsed. And so, when we think about, just as you were saying, the kinds of psychological things that can eclipse the light, and we were equating, or you were equating, that light is often associated with consciousness and with the ego, because when there's light, let's say, in the room, you know, we can perceive what's in the room. If the room were plunged into absolute darkness, I mean, that kind of darkness where you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Mm -hmm. That our ability to be aware of the environment is, of course, uh, eliminated for the most part. So it makes sense that light and consciousness would go hand in hand. And so one way we can think about uh, the soul Niger is what happens during a creative depression. That the unconscious reaches up and kind of takes our life force and plunges us into this strange, dark, psychological mm-hmm. state where often our first impulse is to feel like we're drowning and run to the doctor and get an antidepressant and 
call our friends and say, listen, take me out on the town. I need to shake off this uh, feeling of darkness in myself. But Jung might have given us better advice, saying, there is a secret light in the midst of your depression, which requires you to look very carefully into new places inside of yourself to see what is suddenly available, perceptible inside of you, which is often potential that you have not noticed before. Mm. Because in the light of consciousness, there are so many very subtle things that are happening inside the psyche that are kind of blotted out by the drive and ambition and agenda of the mm. ego when it's in its really solar, uh, radiant determination. Yeah. I'm thinking about uh, what, what Jung says and what we all know and the, the darkness of depression and this light that comes through in some mysterious way and that we are simply called to face it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Jung is very clear about that, that we, we are called to confront things that terrify the ego. And I'm thinking about, of course, the eclipse of it's not that way for modern people, but ancient people would have been terrified of, and what do you do during the eclipse? Can you bear it? Can you bear the not knowing and all of a sudden darkness comes? Of can we simply have the ability to be present uh, when there is an eclipse, an inner eclipse that is psychological? It could be depression, it could be a compulsion, an addiction, a trauma. A complex of can we somehow simply face it without thinking we have to defeat it? Because if we literalize it to the eclipse that's taking place today in North America, there's nothing you can do about it. But can we bear to look? Can we bear to be present with without collapsing? Uh, you know, and I'm thinking about um, Jung's answer to Job. You know, if we're at the at the very end in the biblical story, um, and in Jung's work, of Job has the audacity to confront Yahweh and say, "Hey, you know, uh, in effect, I have been a really good guy. Yeah, I've been your obedient servant. I've done everything in my power." Uh, what what gives? Why have all these terrible things happened to me? Uh, and the answer, of course, is not an explanation of like, well, you know, you know, here's what I was up to. It's simply Yahweh basically saying, "I am greater. You, your ego, your mortality, uh, cannot uh, question this. It will not fall into." these kinds of ego categories of of explanations or even morality. It simply is. And I think that's maybe part of what eclipses call on us, inner and outer, is can I bear it? Can I look at it? Can I acknowledge it and still be present? Or will I be cast into uh you know simply uh a uh, terror or or taken over or lose my sense of self in, in the face of what's going on and i think jung's work with amplification is trying to do just that by mm-hmm. at least surmising that all of the things that eclipse the ego all of the complexes mm-hmm. terrors traumas they are organized inside of our souls around an archetypal phenomena, an archetypal structure. And when we really get a sense of how the archetypes influence us so profoundly, 
both painfully as well as positively, we might have a sense of the numinosity of what has overtaken us. That Mm. the, the depression, in fact, could be seen as awe filled, awful, as the eclipse, that uh, the death of, of a beloved one in the family, or even the, the death of a, mm-hmm. a beloved pet, that in the midst of the pain, there is still something larger than us in what has happened. I think that religious feeling mm. plays some part of that, that there is part of a plan or a larger unfolding mm. that is happening that can also bring us to our knees psychologically and otherwise, and that there is something is added to us, strengthens us, I think, when we can have that sense of, as you said, transcendence, the spiritual, mm-hmm. the greater, yeah. all filled in our troubles and in the times when we feel that we have been blotted out temporarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This takes me to the idea of surrender. Mm-hmm. And that sometimes we have to surrender. Uh, as, you know, as an ancient human on the planet, when this happened, we would simply have to surrender to the, probably the dread of what is going on and uh, is the world coming to an end. Uh, sometimes we have to surrender to something like a depression. That we, If we could think our way out of a depression, oh my God, we would. Anybody would. Any day of the week. Uh, that that there is something here, not of my creation and not of my choosing. And I have to bow to it. The ego is forced sometimes to surrender to something that looks dark as well as something that looks Numinous and luminous. And, and even the things that are luminous can be just as dangerous. Mm. We tend to feel the darkness more. But mm. that is just, a, as you were saying, that fear of loss of power or loss of immediate perception. You know, I was thinking about um, the stories of how damaging that it can be to simply stare into the sun during the partial eclipse mm-hmm. uh, because the sunlight seems to have diminished. That um, I'm, I'm sure that in the ancient world this had to happen because nobody, there were no optometrists giving people <laughs> advice about this. So the sun begins to fade. I'm sure you had entire villages who were staring right into the sun as oh, the moon yes. is gobbling it down. And optometrists and uh, ophthalmologists can actually look at the cornea and see the shape of the damage and predict as times that there actually is a small huh. crescent that has been burned out of the cornea. Oh my gosh. From staring at the sun. And because the cornea has no nerve endings in it, it can't sense pain, the next morning, all of a sudden, you get out of bed and you can't see the people across the table Mm -hmm. from you, that you've been moonstruck, so to speak. And that doesn't come back. So I'm sure another part of the uh, fear of the eclipse is that hundreds if not thousands of people innocently staring at the eclipse the next morning and from then on can never see correctly again. Mm -hmm. So staring right at the light sometimes can be just as dangerous 
as what we mm-hmm. feel the darkness will bring. But being able to look at the eclipse when it's in its fullness, apparently that is not damaging to the retina. So there are certain things that happen in the psyche, mm. perhaps even certain things that happen in the world around us, that we have to shield our eyes from. Mm-hmm. We do this instinctively with children. We won't let them see certain things. We don't want the image of certain horrible things burned into their mm. imagination. Yes. And as adults, we often foolishly mm-hmm. feel that we can be exposed to anything, that we can now see every image of every terrible thing that's happening on the planet yeah. through the internet and keep looking at it the way an uninformed person might stare at the sun during an eclipse as it burns away and injures us in some fashion. Yeah. It's, you're ma- making such a good point that I'm enlarging on uh, taking a jump over to video games and social media and any, all that stuff that catches people up on screens. And it's feeding uh, ego. You know, we're entranced by it the same way that someone might have been entranced by looking up at the sun during the solar eclipse and and damaging uh, cornea and retina. You know, are we feeding our egos the light of uh, all the stuff on screens and all the sensationalist stuff, all the stuff that's in the news? It's all the time. It's, hey, did you hear about, wait a minute, there was a story, there was a... Uh, we get excited, mm. and ego gobbles it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, what kind of psychic burns are we sustaining, so to speak, from feeding our egos, you know, all day, every day, and living most of us lives very distant from, from nature? versus living in an enchanted or an ensouled world in which our egos are relativized, which is a sort of awkward but very Jungian phrase, (laughs) that we need to realize that our egos are not running the show, although we like to think that our egos are, Uh, that there is something greater that Jung called the self. Mm. And we can get glimpses, intimations, hints, and experiences of it when we see something filled with awe, like the eclipse, or like your first time seeing the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. That there's something greater. My ego is not all there is. And we long, I think we long to know that, uh, to feel it, to see it, or hear it, or, you know, really experience it in vivo, which um, I'm going back to my rant about screens. You can't do that on a screen. You could be excited on a screen. Um an experience of true relationship, felt connection to something greater? I don't think so. And we fill our lives with with that and are hungry for the transcendent. Which, on a more hopeful note, takes me to the rebirth theme. Mm -hmm. The sun dies. And it reemerges. Even if we were in the ancient world and no one had ever told us about an eclipse, the fact that the sun does reemerge, even when we are uncertain that it could, that we emerge after, let's say, a terrible loss, a period of mourning, that we also rise like the sun in a way that we could not have predicted. And to have had that even once in one's life, 
mm-hmm. can give us a sense of certainty around that. I need just a moment to share something with you. We started this Jungian life because we believed wholeheartedly that Jung's ideas are universally helpful and healing. Our mission is to make his work relevant to everyone by showing how it can be applied to everyday problems. Many of you have written in telling us it's working. Now our next stage of growth is up to you. The algorithms that distribute or withhold our content only respond to you. And the solution is so easy. Help us reach more people by following us on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe on YouTube and also tap the tiny bell in the upper right corner of your screen. And follow us on Spotify. Tap the bell there too. You can do that right now. Just tap or click. That's it. Thank you for caring enough to help us. We don't doubt the things that we experience. You know, we're just not made that way. You know, and, and I often use the analogy of, you know, when you know something, you know it forever. And my simple homespun analogy is, you know, when you're, you know, six or seven years old, five years old, you learn to ride a bike. You know that. You know you can ride a bike. And you will know how to ride a bike for the rest of your life, uh, e- even if you haven't ridden a bike like me for 20 years. I know how to ride a bike. Mm-hmm. I know what it feels like. I, I, I know it in my cellular structure. And I think when you have an experience of awe, you know it in a way uh, that is beyond doubt. I felt it. I saw this. I know. And I not only know with my, my eyes and my body and all of that, I know with my psychic organ, organ of apperception. We have the ability to experience things psychically. And that's how we know and feel and live into an experience of awe, you know, and dread and reverence and all of those things is through our ability to perceive something psychically that is just as real as um, touch or hearing or sight. And when we come through that cycle of death and resurrection internally, Mm. it imparts a kind of lived authority, which is what you were saying, Deb, Mm. that if one has gone through a thing, we know. Mm -hmm. We don't speculate. We know. Yes, yes. And that's exactly what Jung said at the end of his life. He was uh, being interviewed uh, for, I think, a BBC presentation it's still available and the interviewer asks him if he believes in god and jung says i don't believe i know uh so so that there is something more there is something greater we are and we are part of something greater that we're part of an earth and a planet and a cosmos and stars and, 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 how do we feel held in, in that? Can we, can we trust it? Is there meaning in it? Do we belong? And when we turn sometimes to myth, ancient images, symbols, texts, that we're looking for the language that can help bridge mm-hmm. our ego state to something that is larger than us. And this is why myths and religions have such a lasting quality, is that they create some of that psychological bridging mm-hmm. between the smallness of our ego and at least the promise of something that is more transcendent. I was coming back to the idea of the eclipse and the things that we survive that eclipse the ego. 
and about the idea that when we have experienced that internal eclipse and have come out the other side of it, that we carry a kind of authority, a lived authority. And thinking Mm. about how we seek out people who have had that kind of lived authority. Uh, For instance, someone, someone who's just discovered they're going to go through a divorce. They'll often go to someone else that they know well and say, hey, you went, you came through the divorce, you Aww. went through this eclipse, and, and came out the other side. You know, I need to talk to you. I, I, need, I need to know something or know what it's like to enter into this eclipse and to come out the other side. Changed, perhaps, but intact. We go to someone that's perhaps overcome a terrible illness that we've been diagnosed with. We want to to be around people who have survived the eclipse of a terrible illness or other kinds of eclipsing experiences. And that these things happen to us. Uh, That when you're in it, uh, you're, you're in it. And that, you know, going back to your idea here of the black sun or the light in the light in the dark, uh, that we're not alone in it. Uh, we're still part of something greater. Uh, we'd like to believe, you know, all the time in what, you know, ego would construct as a happy ending of, you know, that the terrible illness of someone who is uh, needed and beloved and important in a, in a family, um, that it may not be fixed from the ego's point of view. A- and while we are in the midst of something greater darker, and connecting, if we can find it. We can be there. And one way or another, it will change. And we are in the hands uh, sometimes of a mystery Mm -hmm. of, of how will it change? How will we come out the other side? But we don't always know. We don't at all. And, and that is yeah. part of the, both the fear and the, the beauty and the transformational possibility mm-hmm. of, of some of these things. Um, leaning into that, there is, um, in the Gospels, there is a description mm-hmm. that only shows up in the book of Luke, who is recounting crucifixion. And uh, he writes, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And so, in that surrender, to the, to the events that we cannot control, mm-hmm. whether they're internal events, yeah. like overwhelming psychological states, life events that are thrust upon us for all kinds of reasons, that there is a darkness and, and there is a feeling that the light has failed. Yes. That something has been torn apart inside of ourselves. And that we are in that stasis, that we are waiting in that torn darkness inside of ourselves, waiting for something deeper to reorganize our mm-hmm. ability to cope, to move forward. Again, Jung speaks to this and suggests that it is the archetype of the self, that there is an archetype of wholeness that is capable of reordering 
the internal heavens, mm-hmm. reordering the stars inside of us, reordering mm-hmm. our attitudes, yeah. our priorities that activates inside of us in a way that the ego cannot control or command. And then we come forward different. Yeah. I, I like that idea of the internal cosmos, of, of our internal stars uh, being, being realigned, and that the self uh, mythologically uh, can act on us in these very sudden, unanticipated ways, as it must have seemed to ancient man, that, that all of a sudden, oh my God, what's happening? Um, and being terrified, taken by surprise, uh, as, a, as a metaphor for the self, for the divine, that the divine can engineer an intervention, so to speak, that just stops us in our tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the Christian tradition, of course, the self uh, knocked uh, Saul, who would become St. Paul, uh, off his horse, and he was blinded for three days. So it is an experience of the self, uh, the divine, in all its power uh, that can just uh, take us by the scruff of the neck and shake us to the core, and that when we come out of it, we are different. We have a different alignment. We we know we are part of something greater because something greater eclipsed us in a way that we cannot doubt. Mm. And, and then I think the next step is, you know, that we have, we all, from time immemorial, mankind has had a relationship with the gods, the God, it's, as it's been imagined in so many ways. And what does that relationship look like? In, in, in daily waking life, uh, I love that image of the warriors shooting arrows at, at the demon that swallowed the sun. Of, uh, we're we're going to ride to the rescue, so to, so to speak. I'm mixing metaphors. Um, you know, I'm going to engage this mm-hmm. in, in the best way that I know how. We can approach it and we can feel scared. We can feel heroic. We can feel uh, awestruck. We can feel all kinds of things. But, you know, are, how are we going to have a relationship with the something greater, you know, after the event has passed? And then there are all the dreams that come from that uh, internal cosmos that you uh, referenced, Joseph, which I really like, of where, what is that area that is just in me, in you, comes through me, comes through you, and we can't pinpoint it. To this day, no one knows really what the physiology, so to speak, of dreams is. It resists being captured by science. So we do have an internal cosmos, and it is alive. So that there are all these ways, I think, of connecting with what is greater um, between me and me, or you and you through a dream, uh, in lived relationship in waking life. taking time out uh, to simply look at the clouds, to have a reverie, to pray, to do what people may do. And then these huge cosmic transcendent experiences where the heavens themselves turn our lived experience upside down. And that we seek them. We need them that they are a kind of nutrient <laughs> for the soul and that yeah. something in us is starved for it. 
Yes. Even if we don't realize, but we find ourselves taking days off from work, driving all the way down to Texas from Maine, and feeling that something is carrying us. There is a determination to do this thing, to have this encounter at all costs. And maybe it's witnessing the eclipse, but there are many other things that we could equate to that same calling, that same vocatus, that mm. the thing that I just must encounter, the thing I must do, the thing that I can't explain, or nobody seems to understand why I, I just have to do mm -hmm. this thing, that there's a call mm. for the encounter. Finishing up here with the eclipse, that in this world where there is so much suspicion and doubt about the validity of an internal spiritual experience, that we are called to look upon something that cannot be invalidated. Mm. And so those many hundreds of thousands of people that have flocked into the path of the eclipse to stand there. And I would suspect that part of them has already experienced the way in which their egos have invalidated the numinous. Mm. We have all had numinous moments. As you said, if, if nowhere else in a dream that we woke from, yeah. something transcendent, but how easily we dismiss, how, how easy and facile the ego has become at pushing something larger than us away. Mm -hmm. So to find ourselves there on the ground, staring at the eclipse and being reduced to, to something that we can't invalidate, mm -hmm. no matter how hard we try, yeah. and that we need that, Somewhere. We need that somewhere. And here with the eclipse, uh, there is the experience that cannot be denied, cannot be invalidated. And it's an experience of, of such a unity of that everybody will experience it, uh, down to the smallest insect, mouse, bird, bee, uh, there's a wholeness in being caught up uh, in it. And we need it and can have it in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we can relate to the something greater in a lot of ways in our lived lives. And we have access to dreams that I think most people who pay attention to dreams are gifted with a numinous dream from time to time, a sense of, I, I did not create this. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no lived experience of, uh, you know, this particular kind of mountaintop uh, with fire at its crests, let's say. <laughs> um, that we know there is something more, and we we need it, and we can have it. And maybe Not, that's a yes. That's a yeah. perfect transition into yeah. uh, into right. our dream for today. So um, let us wish all those viewing the eclipse, uh, the clear skies, and the experience. I hope you're going to have today. It's all you hope it will be, and remember. It's available in smaller amounts and through different channels all day, every day. <laughs>
They have evil grins on their face and say, Yes. We go to an abandoned factory-like complex, meet an Asian man there who follows us down very deep underground. We climb down metal staircases, and everything is pitch black. We get to the basement, and there is a dark, robed figure. It says, It's good that you came here, but come back tomorrow and all will be explained. The other people I'm with get disappointed. We leave the complex and I go home. The next day I get the call from the unattractive woman and she asks if I can pick her up for the meeting with the dark-robed figure, and I comply. When we arrive, she asks not to tell that she's here with me to the dark-robed figure. I go to speak with the figure, and he takes off his hood, and it's my chief from the military unit who I get along with. We go down to the same basement, and there are a lot of people all looking like fighters. The dark-robed figure, we'll call him K, now says that I need to go first into the ring. I see my opponent. He's strong and fit, and he's bad-mouthing me. He's saying how the fight's going to be so easy for him. The fight starts. He kicks me. I grab his leg and I make a painful move on him. It's not to traumatize him, so I let go. He boasts how I was lucky while coming back to Kay. Kay is very disappointed and says that I should have finished the job. I still hear my opponent bad-mouthing me, and that angers me. So I grab a machete off the ground and start whacking my opponent and everyone else in the basement. Kay, the unattractive woman, the guy she was making out with, the Asian man who joined you. We kill a lot of people in that room, and we are soaked in blood. And Kay says to me that it's finally time for me to meet him. Kay tells me to wait in the dark staircase that leads to the basement. The unattractive woman says to me, Whatever, don't look at them. Mm. I hear Kay's voice and two other distorted voices talking. But I only hear one set of footsteps that are walking on metal stairs. The figures start descending the stairs with Kay. I get a glimpse through the corner of my eye that one of the black figures is smaller and the other bigger. The smaller one approaches me. I don't look at its face. I only look at its feet. But I only see some sort of dark smoke. The mm. smaller figure says to me, You are interesting, and tells the other bigger figure to approach me. I feel immense pressure around me. The dark figure grabs my chin and says it's fine to look at him. I look at where the face is supposed to be, and I wake up. He gives us a bit of context and writes that he is currently on a path to change his career and that he had some relationships, problems with a crush that he was talking to. He says the main feelings in the dream were, surprisingly, that he didn't feel fear or scared, even though the dream looks quite dark and cruel and gloomy, but he was feeling relaxed and even in some sort of a bliss. And then he adds that he really wants to know more about the dark figures that appeared also the Asian fellow and the unattractive girl and the good-looking guy. And he says that the only figure that he met in real life was the dark-robed figure that turned out to be Kay, whom he actually knew.
So one just little bit that I'm, I know we've said many times in the podcast that um, this guy's 27 Mm. and he is moving towards his first Saturn return (laughs) astrologically. And and I don't think of myself as uh, an overly knowledgeable astrologer. I'm kind of an armchair cocktail party astrologer, (laughs) (laughs) but uh, just enough to be entertaining. But that right about every 27 to 30 years, Saturn returns to the same position it held at the moment of your birth. And it's said that there is a a kind of spiritual activation that happens inside of us that can be very challenging, but it does forward our growth, often by awakening an internal pressure. So I'm thinking about this guy going down into the unconscious. Yeah and encountering this dark figure that initiates him into this enormous amount of shadow. And it reminds me of Saturn or Kronos, there in the underworld, Mm. um, forcing him to know something, and that even though in a naturalistic way the images are frightening, but psychologically it's almost blissful for him to come into contact with all of this dynamism that is somewhere in the unconscious. It's, um, you know, what this, this dream uh, made me remember the movie Fight Club. Mm-hmm. And uh, looking for transcendence uh, through violence. Mm-hmm. A- and, and, you know, that may seem like such a, an impossible thing to even conceive of or say, but um, violence is a way of achieving transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, when we kill something, it is transformed. Mm -hmm. Uh, When, you know, we conquered the Wild West, politicians um, running for office talk about how they're going to fight for you, their constituents. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's very alive in our culture um, and certainly in the psyche. And here is the descent. Our dream ego has a descent. Uh, they go into this basement, uh, and there's a dark robed figure who is our dreamer's military chief, his, um, the officer, I guess, to whom he reports. Mm-hmm. But anyway, a, a figure who is senior to the dream ego. And um, so he gets along well with them. They all go down. Um, the opponent thinks the fight will, fight will be easy. And our dream ego says, um, I make a painful move on him not to traumatize him. So I let go. Uh, and then. K, his superior officer, the dark robe figure, says, you should have finished the job. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have let him off. And the opponent is still bad-mouthing. And then there's this whole um, melee of uh, the ugly woman, K, the guy she made out with, the Asian man, um, and it, it's a, a real bloody a real bloody mess. I am very curious as to what needs to be battled. What what is the fight in the psyche that is taking place down below in this basement uh, with these other dream figures against an unknown opponent? Uh, and the smaller figure says at the end, you're interesting, and our dream ego feels immense pressure around me. And the dark figure says, it's fine to look at him. So I'm wondering about the archetype of battle Mm -hmm. and of fighting to the finish and some kind of heroic, uh, aura that this has taken on, you know, in the dream. 
Well, I, I take your point that, well, one, there is something in the unconscious that he must encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's undeniable. I, I want to just come back to the beginning of the dream for a moment as we then talk about what's going on in the basement. <laughs> Jung talked about, in very general terms, that there are three stages of development. One is shadow work. The second stage is the anima animus work, this encounter with the contrasexual. And if we then can blend with these opposite personality qualities, then we set the stage for the incarnation of the self, which is the fullness of the personality. So it starts, and the dream ego is seeing the beginning of a connection between the feminine and the masculine. These people are making out on the sofa. <laughs> that were to continue, maybe there would uh, come a more intimate kind of union. But the dream ego can't relate to that. And he says, ugh, I need something more interesting. So it seems like there is a bid for him to become interested in this anima animus yeah. integration. But for him, that the female or the feminine is not attractive enough. It's troubling to him, which may have something to do with you know, work that he needs to do with his inner feminine. But because he cannot relate to the conjunctio, he can't relate to the integration of the anima, then he is sent back to do more shadow work, which is how, how it happens we have to integrate enough shadow in order to move on to the next stage of development towards individuation. And they say, sure, we, we will lead you to this other piece of work for you. And then, of course, we go into the underground and there is a, there is a test. Yeah. So it's an artificial battle at first because there's a ring and there's a boxing ring or some kind of a context and he's sparring and he's using his sparring skills just as one might do let's say in, in a dojo or a karate studio you're not supposed to actually hurt the people you're training with but you're practicing these skillful moves he kicks grabs the legs you know, he gives the guy a little twist, let's say, a little <laughs> pain. He, he doesn't want to, to really injure someone because he's just sparring. But there's something inside of the psyche that says, this isn't a game. Uh. You can't just spar with your life. You are really in a battle with something inside of yourself, and one you could say that the psyche wants him to know something about his own lethality. The psyche needs him to come out of this encounter with a full sense of responsibility for the way in which he can be dangerous, and to not, not hedge about it, not, not make any silliness. That you, you are capable of being very dangerous, perhaps as a military person, but also just as a human being. Now, it seems that he needs someone to give him permission. That his natural tendency is to just spar, but K, I'm not sure exactly what K represents inside of him, says, no, you have to finish the job. And then somehow he has access to anger, which was not present earlier. And then he's able to, to go into this great kind of berserker mode. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like the Vikings. It, it, yeah, exactly. It's, it does feel very much um, like berserker mode of that. Is this really the, the something about a battle of our dream ego is sparring at first, 
and then it shifts into this berserker uh, kind of process of uh, that everything, it, there's a machete and there's blood everywhere. They kill everybody in the room. Maybe the dream is raising the question of what are you fighting? What are you fighting for? What are you fighting against? H- how do you fight? Where is the difference between sparring, not taking it really seriously enough, versus just going berserk? Um, that it's not, this is not a warrior stance that our dream ego is uh, evidencing. But you ask the opponent and everyone else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's uh, somewhat indiscriminate. And uh, uh, in the comments, he says that he is uh, currently on a path to change his career. And mm-hmm. as you noted, um, the time of the first Saturn return, which as it just so happens, um, astrology aside or not, uh, happens in the late 20s. There is a real realignment and redirection of uh, what am I doing? I've been out there oftentimes in my first career or continuing education or traveling or a hundred things. And then there's a reorientation along around our our late 20s of Oh, I need a new orientation, a new stance, a new attitude. And uh, and I wonder if that is very much what's happening for our dream ego of how do we how do we engage? How do we how do we fight? What do we fight for? Who are we fighting? Mm-hmm. Uh, we usually find out that we're fighting ourselves. Um, So it feels like our dream ego is just approaching this uh, reorientation that's going to take energy. It's going to call him Mm -hmm. to engage. So if I step away from some of the lurid imagery and I just (laughs) sit with the bones of it, Uh um, I'm only sparring. Some other internal figure says, but you're not finishing your jobs. He gets angry and then he goes wild. So this is a situation that many of us find ourselves in at times in our lives. Mm -hmm. There is a task set before us that we just can't finish. Mm -hmm. We can't get any traction on. Maybe it's finishing your dissertation. You did all your PhD work and your Mm -hmm. ABD, all but dissertation. And There's a final battle, kind of write that dissertation. Or there's, you know, some very complicated certification that you would need to take to become a, a, you know, a project manager at a whole new level. Mm -hmm. Um, And you'll spar with doing your dissertation. You'll pretend that you're going to Mm -hmm. take this very complicated project management certification. Um, And then something is, Science says, you're not finishing the job. When are you going to finish the job? <laughs> and then there's a, there's a provocation. You know, the opponent starts bad-mouthing him and said, yeah, you're a loser, this and that, which, of course, happens inside of us. But it's access to anger. And anger is, in general, that energy that allows us to push through an obstacle. It gives us enough redness to get the engine going. We have to get angry at enough in ourselves for being avoidant, that we kind of do the job that we've been avoiding doing. Uh, as you had said, Deb, that um, this doesn't seem to very skilled, so <laughs> everything's getting whacked um, without discrimination, um, although it does seem adequate enough for him to take some kind of next step which we don't understand. Yeah. The dream ends with a smaller dark figure saying to the dream ego, you are interesting. Mm -hmm. 
And then he tells the other bigger dark figure, the man's military superior, K, to approach. He says, I feel immense pressure around me. The dark figure grabs my chin and says, it's okay to look at him. Mm -hmm. Uh, So something with our dream ego's engagement has created this ending. Mm-hmm. Of now the dark figure, his military superior, K, they're looking face to face and eye to eye as a result first of this descent, then the sparring, and then this berserker sort of bloodbath with anger and feeling. Mm-hmm. So, no, it's not very skilled. <laughs> of just grab a machete and start whacking at every, everybody around you. No, not skilled. And it is maybe a first necessary stage of engagement. Mm-hmm. But he still ends up feeling pressured, mm-hmm. as often happens when we don't get the job done. Yeah. So I got really angry, and then I started, I don't know, furiously reading <laughs> a bunch of books, and then I wrote a bunch of paragraphs, <laughs> and then I and then I threw it all away, and then I wrote it again, and then you know, at the end of it, I, I actually just ripped up my entire dissertation that I had worked on because it wasn't good enough. And then all of a sudden, I feel a lot of pressure. <laughs> you're, you're, you're re-evoking everyone's thesis experience here. No. <laughs> but I think, I think that's an important distinction, that the feeling of anger gets him activated, mm-hmm. not in a skilled way. And right. that is different from the job that needs to be done of what is the job you're here to do, and where is there some kind of a different choice between uh, kind of fooling around sparring and going berserk. Um, And I'm perceiving the end of the dream uh, as a very positive comment, that the dark Mm -hmm. figure grabs my chin and says, it's okay to look at him. Look at me. He has a positive relationship with this man in waking life. Uh, It's a superior. So this may be a kind of initiatory dream. Uh, This is what the first engagement looks like. It's messy. Right. That's okay. (laughs) His first task was actually something we often all have to do when we're not getting the job done. As we go into the unconscious and there's an inner figure that's just bad-mouthing us. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like yes. we go to write the thesis and someone's like, you big dummy, yeah, you don't know do you what you're you doing, are? who do you think you are? <laughs> and then something in the psyche says, I think you need to do battle with the bad mouther yeah. and triumph over him, and then you'll get the job done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he, he goes at the bad mouther. He does seem to win that battle, but of course now the dissertation's in pieces. Mm-hmm. Everything's soaked in blood. Um, (laughs) but it may be possible that he did triumph over the bad mouther, even though there's a lot of cleanup that's got to happen down there. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Overall, I think this is a really, it's an encouraging dream of where's the battle, what kind of fight is called for, what kind of job needs to get done here? He's 27, and it's, he's embarking on a new career, a new life path. He's right on track, right on time, and we never know exactly where Psyche is going. Absolutely, but it seems to be that the wildness has calmed down, and there's a couple of internal, I suppose, authority figures. Mm-hmm that are ostensibly going to help reorganize a little yeah. bit of something. I also want to offer one more amplification that I think is interesting, is that everything is soaked in blood, but it's the inner feminine that um, gives him advice, which, which is often what the anima will do mm-hmm. inside of a man's psyche. Although he's been swinging the machete around, creating all kinds of carnage, the inner feminine says, whatever you do, don't 
look at them. She's still trying to help him. And it reminds me of the um, uh, fairy tale or myth of Kulhanan, which in Irish mythology, Kulhanan was this amazing warrior and was responsible for protecting all of Ireland. But what would happen is when he would go into war, that he would enter into a kind of unstoppable frenzy, which was incredibly helpful. But as he went from battle to battle to battle, Kulhanin would start just turning on his own, his own men and just go into yeah. a killing frenzy. And then there is one time where they just cannot stop him. But he is the perfect warrior, so no one can stop him. And what they decide is they need to find the most beautiful woman in the village who is able to slowly approach him and touch him and bring him back from the yeah. frenzy of war. And there's just a little bit of that in the dream. Not exactly the same, but in the end, on the field of battle, that there is a feminine figure that's still there with him, trying to give him advice. Now, he doesn't take the advice, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. He finds the woman not attractive, which I think is another piece of growth that he needs to, to yeah. take on. Yeah. Because she may be quite right that even though the figure says, look me in the eyes, but his soul said, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Something, something that's not good for you might happen. Uh, so, and his work right now, his work right now may be much more with, with shadow figures than it, mm. than it is with his inner feminine, the inner opposite with his anima. Uh, it may be, you know, on the battleground. Mm hmm of where his life is moving now uh, and and the model in Waking Life that Kay, the dark-robed figure, uh, presents for him. Mm -hmm. He may be more on hero's journey mode uh, for the time being because mm -hmm. at the end of the dream, I'm not sure whether it is the anima figure who says, don't look at them, whose advice should be heeded, mm -hmm. or whether it's the dark robe figure at the end who says, it's okay to look at me, mm -hmm. of to look at shadow. Um, we don't know, and we can just imagine that more dreams will be shedding more direction, light, and insight yeah, on this life passage for this dreamer. Absolutely. He's in the middle of a, a really intense process. Yeah. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.